one. <clears throat> so this is the lecture for uh, modern humans. Um, but before we do that, I want to just go over a couple things with you real quick. So the next annual edition is due today? The 5th, yeah, it's due today. Um, so typically I record these lectures a few days in advance, but this week I, you, I have no makeup on right now. Like I have not been feeling good the last few days. Um, and, and also you probably noticed that it took me a, a little while to get you through your exams because I've been kind of sick. Um, but uh, that's the other thing. Okay, wait, so real quick. Okay, so annual editions number 56, um, that's due today. I've already received a, a few of them from you guys, so I'm sure those will keep coming in, just a quick reminder. And uh, the exams, exam one, those are all graded. Um, so those are all graded. And I sent everyone um, either uh, e notes in an email or um, the exam back with notes and a grade. Like, so you should have heard from me in some w way regarding your exam, either like just an email or an edited exam, depending on what you sent me and how you sent it to me. Um, so those are all sent back to you and then the grades have been entered in Canvas. If for some strange reason you have submitted something to me and it, it, you do not get a grade for it, let me know. As far as when I, I like I double checked because you know sometimes people send me things later and, I, and I, as far as I know they're all graded. I still had maybe I think two students who didn't submit one. But at this point, um, I think sometimes I still see students in my, on my roster who, who aren't technically in the class, so that could be the case anyway. Those are graded, and it was there was an A minus average, so you guys did really well. There were it was mostly A's and you know a handful of higher B's. There were a few people who didn't do very well, and for, and, and if you're one of those people, you know why. I sent you you know notes regarding the lower grade. Um, there were I think a few issues with people turning in stuff really late, so you got marked down for that, and or only doing part of the exam. So you guys all. You guys are all familiar that there were five questions. You you were supposed to do a half a page, double space per question. So this was very clear in the instruction. So the end result should have been a minimum of two and a half pages. Um, like I said, most of you hit that or a little longer, no problem. But there were a few people who would give me, you know, uh, either they just wouldn't address one of the questions. They'd only do three out of the five questions. So of course, they're going to get marked down for that. Or they would give me, you know, uh, one sentence. So that's obviously not an essay response. So. Um, but if that was you and you're like, oh, I totally bombed this, this one, um, just remember that there are so many other um, assignments this semester for you to bring up your grade. So don't stress too much. And there's always extra credit. So, But like I said, A minus average. You guys did really well as a group. I was really impressed with a lot of your, your answers. You guys knew some of the questions, you know, were more of a, I wanted a specific response and some of them were a little more open-ended and it seemed as if as a class you guys did really well. You're clearly... Um, you know, reading the material, you're clearly watching the PowerPoints and watching my lectures, you know, based on what I've, what I've read and, and your responses. So that's really great. And um, I think that's pretty much it for the, for, for just that quick announcement. Okay, so we'll get right into, oh, and uh, like what I was going to say also was because the, um, I just wasn't feeling good this last week that I, it just took me a lot longer to get through the exams. Normally, I probably wouldn't take maybe like a week, depending on how busy that week was in, in, other, in other things. Um, you know, I'm, I try to be really quick with, with grading for you. I know like, I know what it's like to be a student, like what's my grade, you know? So um, this one took me a little longer, just so you know, like uh, that's, that was why, you know, I was getting through like two exams a day and then I'd like take another nap. So it was just the whole thing. Um, okay. So we're gonna get into this PowerPoint on modern humans. So the last one we did was, the last PowerPoint was on the genus Homo. <clears throat> so we're building up, we've been talking about those earlier hominins, then oh, the Australopithecines, then we talked about our genus, the genus Homo, um, and uh, kind of building up to talking about modern humans. And I know I've said this multiple times before in these lectures that all of this kind of you know evolutionary um, paleo stuff is kind of building up to as when we start talking about you know modern humans and and more modern stuff it's gonna we're gonna be referencing a lot of that um, evolutionary time a lot of those earlier speed like a lot of that those details are gonna make sense when we start talking about stuff later like like I mentioned before understanding how why things are happening now it's important to look at the origins of those you know biologically or culturally so that's why we're doing it <clears throat> okay so slide two on modern humans so we're talking about Homo sapiens. 
Now there's a term here, anatomically modern humans. Um, and this is like in contrast to the term behaviorally modern. So we would say like if you looked at a human, like a homo sapien in like from like 2020 and compared it to a homo sapien from, you know, 80,000 years ago, let's say. Physically, they would look essentially like the same, but behaviorally, they're going to look very different. So often when we're talking about homo sapiens, we will kind of reference if we're talking about like the anatomy and how we're similar or behaviorally how we're often, you know, different. So large brain, so rem remember we were talking about the brain sizes of all those different hominins and how we saw brain size is one of those hallmarks of hominins, you know, bigger brains, but happening a little more slowly and then kind of a big jump with the genus Homo, you know, with, um, we see Heidelbergensis at about 1200 cc's, or like a little rectus around 1000 cc's, Heidelbergensis 1200, Neanderthal is even bigger than modern humans, and we see humans here at around 13 to 1400 cc's. So there are a few what we call derived features. I think I mentioned this to you guys before. The term derived just means like new feature, like evolution, like, you know, phenotypic features we see. So a few interesting, unique things to humans, homo sapiens, we see. Um, brains are big, but remember that Neanderthals did have the largest brain. But human, homo sapiens do have a very, very big brain. But also it's the shape of the, of the head that's really unique. So we have what's called a globular brain or like globe shaped, more round. We have a nice vertical forehead. We don't have that long, low, um, football-shaped cranium that we see with other species. Even Neanderthals, who had a very big brain, um, bigger than ours, we, they still have that, that, that shape. So this is interesting, like we're kind of the weird one in this, and so there's, we are not sure why this happened. Was it, um, had something to do with sexual selection? Did it have something to do with certain areas of the brain expanding and others, not, we not needing them? So it changed kind of the shape of the brain, and then of course then changed the shape of the skull. Was it about, you know, mastication muscles? Like, the, trust me, like, we're still trying to figure this one out. But we know, like, it's a thing that, you know, homo sapiens do have this, this very unique shaped head. We also have an orthognathic face. So recall that term prognathic, so the projection of the face. Uh, orthognathic basically just means there's no prognathism. It's essentially a flat face. So we see that with homo sapiens are, you know, this, this profile is like flat. There's no projection really. Um, and we have a nice vertical forehead, as you can see with mine, like we don't have a big brow ridge, we don't have just a little forehead and then back, like we have a nice big forehead and uh, that's unique. Okay, slide three. We also are the first hominin to have a chin. And you might be thinking, what do you mean a chin? Like they all had a mandible, like this bone, that's true. But if you look at this picture, this is what I'm talking about. So we're the first hominin to wear, so this, this bone is called the mandible, and this point right here at the front is called the mental eminence. Um, if you see on this picture, it's from that side view, the lateral view. We're the first hominids where that mental eminence actually projects slightly anterior or slightly forward. The, all the other ones, so he, this is a human compared to a Neanderthal, there's kind of a sloping back of that feature. Um, so that probably phenotypically on that individual would have looked very like a very specific way. And, and there, trust me, there have been multiple hypotheses about why we see this. So re recall that I mentioned this before, that we often want to have like some really interesting, you know, uh, natural selection explanation for everything. There has to be some functionality. In reality, a lot of the fe these features are probably sexual selection. And it's, this is probably, I think most paleoanthropologists probably agree this is one thing we just may never know and it's probably sexual selection. Then when you're looking at an individual and they have a very defined jaw versus kind of sloping back into their neck, it might be deemed to be more attractive in some way. Now later we might be able to understand the reasoning that probably has something to do with health or I don't know, like we've talked about with those other features like facial symmetry and stuff. Um, so we'll see, but it's just very interesting that, so when you see a jaw, a mandible, um, and you see that anterior um, projection of the mental eminence, you're like, okay, must be a homo sapien. Slide four. So also with homo sapiens, so we talked about this before, that erectus, hyalbergensis, neanderthals, they all had big brains, and uh, but the, the shape was different. So they had that long, low, more football-shaped cranium. But also if you look at this picture, um, for humans, we also have, like, not just, not, not just even looking from the side, with we have more of a, gl a globe shape, not football shape, we also are, the way um, it's wider in certain areas is, is different from other species. So here we can see it's more, um, sorry guys, I'm still like kind of sick. Oh, 
it's more uh, wide in the parietal region. So I know you guys don't know the names of the, well, I'm assuming you don't, we didn't talk about in this class, you don't know all the names of the bones of the skull. But so this bone right here is called the parietal. And in this region is where it's fairly wide, you can see in that picture versus in other uh, hominins, even when they had larger brains, it tended to be more larger in the like, wider in the temporal region or this region down here. So it's just another interesting thing. Like, did it have to do with, with what areas of the brain are expanding or not? Like, like, like I said, this is a, a question that's still being asked. Um, research that's still being conducted but it's it's a unique thing okay slide five. Oh my goodness mm. Mm. yeah like normally i would have recorded this lecture over the weekend i had it in my planner uh, and uh i almost was gonna message you guys like there wasn't gonna be a lecture there was just gonna be the powerpoint i'm like i don't want to do that to them uh, so it's monday morning it's very very early and I woke up, I'm like, I'll post, it. I'll post it by noon. I'll get it up to them. So hopefully you guys watch this um, because I feel like shit right now. Okay. Modern, okay, so slide five, modern human origins. So the next few slides are kind of text heavy. That's that's for your future reference. I'm not gonna just sit here and read the, the PowerPoint text to you, but I, so I'm gonna, we're gonna kind of skip between slide five and then all the way to slide eight in just a second. Um, but if you're looking at slide, slide five, you'll see that there are two models. So, so when we're talking about human origins, what, what we mean is Homo, like we've talked about those other species in very general terms, but as we're talking about our own species, we're going to be a little more specific. So getting to this idea of, okay, when do we kind of see the first of our species? Like what was before, when, when and why and how did the first Homo sapiens kind of begin? What were the environmental conditions? What were the migration patterns? Like, so what's going on in that very early time? Um, and there are, trust me, there are a lot of hypotheses about many of those factors, but in terms of kind of when we first became uh, Homo sapiens, in terms of like evolution, there are two main ideas. Now I'll tell you now that now in 2020, most people say that one of these is correct over the other. Um, like, you know, let's say like 90% of paleoanthropologists or scientists would say it's the out of Africa model. It's really not a debate anymore now with all this DNA evidence. But there are still some who would say, well, multi-regional still makes sense because of this reason and that reason. But I'll tell you like this, you know, 20 years ago, this was definitely more, it was kind of more split 50-50. So this is why we still kind of talk about it, that it's, it's not quite as much of a debate now as it was like two decades ago, but it definitely was a debate for a long time. So this is why I want you guys to kind of know this. And it's important to understand like debates in the past and why we know that we, the important thing about science, like we, it changes with new evidence. So this is one of those examples. Okay, so there are two main models for understanding the human origins. One we call the multi-regional model and one we call the out of Africa model. The out of Africa model used to be called the complete replacement model, and sometimes now we refer to it as the partial replacement model because the idea, the initial idea kind of made sense, and then now with DNA, DNA evidence, we're like, okay, now it's the picture's more clear, so it's kind of gone through a couple of rename, different names. Anyway, but it's the same idea, okay. So like I said, slide six and slide seven are just explaining those, you know, but the one thing I want you to go to is slide eight, and I'll kind of walk you through. Like I said before, I like having a visual, to me, visual, especially in terms of like timelines versus like bullet points of words. If I have a visual, it's like, oh, I see it more. So if you're the kind of person who wants to read the text, you, I'm sure you also have it in the book, but obviously you also have it in slide six and slide seven. Um, but if you want more of a visual, slide eight. So I'm gonna talk about slide eight. So this is just kind of showing you the difference between those two models in, a, in more of a visual. So we have the out of Africa and then the multi-regional model. So I'll talk about the multi-regional one first. So, so if you look at the bottom, so we're kind of going up in this chart through time. So look at the bottom, it's showing, you know, 1.8 million years ago, Homo erectus is existing, okay. And then it's showing like through time, Homo erectus, because we talked about this, Homo erectus is the first to leave Africa as far as we know now. You know, some evidence is pointing to maybe that's not accurate, but like as far as what the majority of the evidence is pointing to. Homo erectus is the first to leave Africa. Some stay in Africa. So you see that with that middle arrow. Some go into Asia, some go into Europe. So basically, Homo erectus is just kind of moving around in the world. Um, and that's what those, uh, is showing you going to those different areas. Now those little arrows. Waffle, are you okay? Got some snotty. We're all snotty here this weekend. A baby. Oh no. Oh, 
I got two sick girls. Yeah. Oh, goodness. I know. Okay. You snotty girl. You doing better? Oh, you want to look? Okay. Okay. She wants to eat mama's lap. Can we make this work? Can we do it? Okay, let's try it. Um, okay, so multi-regional. Um, so the little arrows between those populations, basically showing like through this period of time, for hundreds of thousands of years, even though those different populations of erectus, you know, some were in Asia, some were in Europe, some were in Africa, that they're still evolving, um, that there's still those side arrows are basically indicating that there's still enough interbreeding amongst those populations that it's that there's still just one species evolving into another and evolving into another, what we call anagenesis, kind of one into the next, into the next. So for those who are multi-regional, uh, what multi-regionalists they would say Erectus evolved into Heidelbergensis, Heidelbergensis evolved into Neanderthals, and then Neanderthals evolved into humans. Um, they would kind of see this one into the next, into the next. So they would see it as that Neanderthals are our ancestors. Um, out of Africa sees it quite differently. And like I said before, um, the DNA evidence absolutely supports out of Africa. So this is what 90 plus percentage of paleoanthropologists and scientists would say, yeah, multi-regional doesn't really make sense. Now, real quick before I talk about out of Africa, multi-regional, you might be thinking that seems weird, like I've never heard of that idea, or maybe you have, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, there was, There is some evidence that supports it in terms of what we see in populations of erectus versus modern humans in terms of like those different regions. Like they, for example, some would say, well, the erectus living in Africa looked like this and modern humans in Africa look like this. They have this particular feature. And Homo erectus in Asia had this feature and modern Homo sapiens had that same feature. So wouldn't that be evidence of that multi-regional, like them kind of evolving, you know, looking similar in that sense. And there's something called convergent evolution. Basically what it means is you can have a similar feature to another animal, but it doesn't mean that it's because of shared ancestry. It could just mean a similar adaptation to, because of a similar environment. So that's probably what we're saying. In, anyway, I don't, want, I don't want to get you guys too bombarded with the details on this um, because like we could spend like a whole class just on this thing. But anyway, okay. So the ad of Africa. So you'll notice starting at the bottom of that chart that the... Mm. Keep talking would be so tiring, you guys. Okay. Um, so they start out the same. Homo erectus, 1.8 million years ago, and the same thing's happening. So some populations of Homo erectus are going into Asia, some are staying in Africa, and some are going into areas of Europe, right? Um, but according to this model, there's none of that in interbreeding between those populations. Out of Africa, proponents would say, look, those populations are so far apart. Like, we live in a very globalized world now, but imagine, like, you'd have to walk. So it makes total sense that these populations were probably very distant and didn't interact with each other in enough, enough to, I mean, over hundreds of thousands of years to stay the same species. So we'll see that Homo erectus in Africa, Homo erectus, and Europe, Homo erectus, and Asia, they're all kind of going on their own evolutionary trajectories without really any, any large amount of interbreeding at all. And so those in Africa would kind of evolve into something, those in, in Asia eventually, you know, like died out, and then the ones in Europe. So basically, it's, it gets a little confusing at this point because we've got, um, you know, Heidelbergensis, like Erectus in, in Africa, Heidelbergensis in like Northern Africa and, and other parts of Africa um, and in parts of Europe. And then, so basically the story is we have Homo erectus evolving into Heidelbergensis in, in at least in, in, you know, like the Africa and, and European areas um, dying out in Asia. And then eventually we have uh, Heidelbergensis in Europe evolving into Neanderthals and the Heidelbergensis in Africa uh, evolving into Homo sapiens. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So humans and Neanderthals, we share a common ancestor in Heidelbergensis. We did not evolve from Neanderthals, but we share a common ancestor with them. And, um, and then we see once modern humans 
are now a species. They then leave Africa. That's what this chart is showing about 50,000 years ago. We see Homo sapiens then leaving Africa, and then that's when they encounter um, Neanderthals in Europe. Oh, baby. Okay. And we do know that we interbred with them. Um, this is why the name changed. It used to be called the complete replacement. We thought, well, we encountered them in Europe and we wiped them out. Either we, like, we out-hunted them or we were smarter or whatever. Um, in fact, we know now that we coexisted for tens of thousands of years with them. Um, we, we probably had a slight advantage in a, in a couple ways that just over time kind of gave us an edge over them. Um, and and uh, you guys have read the um, annual editions about, you know, one of those. There, there are so many. I mean, you guys, we could spend the whole semester talking about Neanderthals. Uh, a lot of people are interested in you. There's so many books out there. If you were interested, it's a really cool idea, uh, topic. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, but we know, like, they were obviously very smart. They were not. They, they, Neanderthals existed longer than modern humans have currently existed. So <laughs> that tells you something. Um, <sighs> okay, I think that's it. I'm going to put you down. Are you okay to get down now? Your snotty's over? Mm. Okay. You can get down, baby. Okay. I'm going to go with this. Okay, so some, um, you don't really have to, like this is just for your references, so, you know, like we have a lot of sites, you can see them listed here in Africa, Asia, Europe from different time periods, showing Homo sapiens, slide 10, um, just some of the migration patterns of Homo sapiens that, um, so like now when we look at the world, most of you are probably familiar with this, but when we look at like continents, and land masses, we know that over time it hasn't always looked like that. Sometimes there's more or less, depending on the level, the sea level, depending on like how much is in the glaciers and how like how much and how little the sea levels will change and we'll have more land exposed or less land exposed. And so when we look at, you know, like 30,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago and we see like different animals, whether it's, you know, some a hominin or another animal migrating, we have to take that into account. So we can say, okay, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense that that populations are there because there was actually more land exposed or they were able to walk across this area or this area, you know, 30,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago when we can't really do that now. Um, so we see this with areas in um, like Indonesia, near Australia, going into the North America from Asia, that a lot of this was a lot. So this is slide 10 and slide 11, you can see this. So. Um, and in fact, in slide 11, it shows this interesting picture. It's like yellow versus green, um, where the more land would have been exposed, you know. This is very interesting. Okay. Slide 12. Tools. So we talked about this before with, we had, you know, old one tools, Acheulean tools, Mysterian tools, and then we get into like, you know, the modern, there are like multiple types. You don't need to know that for this class. If you're taking an intro to archaeology, you'd probably get into it. Um, but just know, we just see different like no surprise we see changes we see things getting more complex we see more variety and with homo sapiens we see a lot we see a lot more detail smaller things very likely being attached to other things like spears and arrows and so we just start to see you know more complexity to that and also because it wasn't as long ago a lot more stuff has preserved things like wood so we talked about this that um there's like one site with we didn't talk about this i'll mention it now with neanderthals we have our um, Heidelbergensis, we have like one site that there was some wooden spears um, preserved. So we know that they had that, but, and this is what we talked about before. We don't always have that, so we don't know. Like, were Erectus using spears? Were, were the Australopithecines digging with wooden shovels? Like, with something, you know? But we don't have that evidence. It doesn't preserve. It's very like le less likely to preserve. But because human stuff is a little more recent, it's more likely we're more likely to find that it has preserved that's still existing for us to see so we see a lot more with like wood and stuff like that very interesting slide 13 um, different types of um, tools and weapons we find you know in association association with these human uh, sites nets different types of traps for animals this really cool thing a spear thrower called an atlatl 
So they're just getting really sophisticated in these hunting techniques. Slide 14, there's evidence of um, like barbed using, well one, like using ant, uh, antler and shell and bone for a lot of this, um, but barbed, um, you know, s um, spears. Things that maybe were needles. This is this is a stretch, but when you see that picture, you're like, that kind of looks like a needle. Were they sewing to some extent? Was this just a ne a bead on a necklace? Like you know, there's some. There are actually, I'd have to think about the the author, but there was this article I read recently. Um, it was from a couple years ago, but it was talking about this that one of the things that probably gave humans the advantage, um, slight advantage over Neanderthals, is that. In, in these slightly colder environments, we were able to sew together clothing versus draping clothing. Yeah, I don't know if like that this might be a stretch, but it's interesting to think about, like like as we do in academia, you know. Um, so interesting. And then slide 15, you see the cave art. So I know I mentioned this before, that we find art with Neanderthals. However, it seems as if the majority of that only happens after Neanderthals have encountered humans. Now, that could just mean that they perfect, like they had the mental and symbolic ability to do that. They were just inspired by the humans. Maybe it's a weird coincidence. Like, time will tell when we get more evidence. Um, but we know he, Neanderthals had a much larger brain than humans. Their EQ was very similar to humans. Um, they clearly had existed very successfully for a long time. So it would be strange to think like they didn't have something. Now, were there differences between human, Bobble? Hey, stop that please. Were there differences between Neanderthal and human art or symbolism or early language probably? Like some of the stuff we'll just never know. But anyway, she sucks. And then slide 16, more art. And slide 17. Okay, so this was what I said at kind of the, at the beginning with the difference between anatomically modern and behaviorally modern. Um, just getting at this idea of like we might look the same physically, but behaviorally there are probably some major shifts that happened um, over the last you know hundred thousand years or, or so. Um, probably having to do with language and language complexity, how that's going to change who we are symbolically and behaviorally. Environments are also drastically changing. And this is the big one, population increase. And this is getting into some of the stuff I was talking to you guys before about, I'm trying to, did I mention this to your class? Population size. I think I mentioned it on a slide before, or a PowerPoint before. Population size is so important. If I didn't mention it to your class, or if you forgot, I'm gonna tell you right now, population size is super important. It's gonna be a major thing we talk about um, from here on out. So populations are now, especially in the last, you know, 10, 20,000 years, populations drastically increase. And this is definitely drastically going to change our social and cultural interactions and experiences like drastically. So I think I mentioned this part to you that when, we, when we're evolving for all this time that we've been talking about for hominids, we're evolving in, in small groups, you know, 50, let's say 50 people, maybe a little smaller, a little bigger, depending. You know, in your mind, you can hold all, all the information about every one of those individuals, their name, who, who their family is, what they like, what they don't like, can you trust them, can you not, what things they're talented at, which, which things they're not. Like, you would be able to hold all that really important social information that can make or break whether your group is successful or not, whether you die or not. Um, so social information is so important to us. But as populations get bigger, we don't have the ability to hold all of that social information in our heads anymore about every individual in our group. When your group is 5,000, there's no way you know. So the, the, the social and cultural interactions between those individuals become more complex, become more symbolic. So we talked about this, how the things you, the, the way that you present yourself to members of your society, when, what's the impression you want to give them with the way you do your hair, the way you do your makeup, whether you wear makeup at all, the clothing you wear, the possessions that you own, the things you show, because they don't know you. And so the, the interactions become much more intricate and complex. Just because populations get bigger, it's a huge factor that, it, for whatever reason, it gets like thrown to the wayside and other things become more. I, to me, I think population is probably one of the most important. It changes so many things and it's, anyway, so it's gonna be a, a big thing we talk about. <sighs> okay, um, so slide 18. And the, so the rest of these slides are just showing you some modern, so we're looking at modern in the last, you know, like say 100 years. Modern humans, and just to appreciate the variation in phenotype, but of course the beautiful, unique variation in 
cultural expression. So here we have, I mean, this is just a tiny minuscule amount of the variation in humanity. We can see some phenotypic and cultural variation. So this is the tiniest little little bit, but just so you guys can appreciate and understand this. So here we have, I've, I've kind of just taken some, some, some pictures from, you know, the different um, continents. So, I mean, you can imagine if we go to each country and each region in a country even more and more specific and it's gonna be more and more unique and interesting and beautiful. This is just a tiny, tiny little bit of this, but you can see here when and we have North America. The next side, we have South America. You can see the very interesting cultural, different cultural expression, probably religiously influenced. Um, how the this is so important. How the environment will impact how you express yourself culturally, whether that is in the clothing you wear, the tools that you make, the food that you eat. If you live in an area that's really cold, you're probably going to wear a lot of clothing to keep yourself warm. If you live in an area that's really hot, you're probably going to wear less clothing. Does that make sense? Like, no surprise. So how you express yourself in terms of clothing might be very different. If you live in an area that naturally has bugs that are, when you crush them, they're blue, you might have a lot of stuff in your culture that's dyed blue. And blue then becomes an important part of your symbolism. But it's because of what's available in the environment. So environment has a lot to do with how we express ourselves culturally. Okay, so slide 20, we see Europe. Um, slide 21. Asia, like I said, just a small, tiny snapshot of, of the variation, the beautiful variation. And then slide 22, Africa. Beautiful, everything about it's so beautiful. Okay, so that's it for this PowerPoint. Um, hopefully I feel better on the next one and I don't look like shit. And, uh, okay. I'll see you guys later.